So the title of my talk tonight is Telephone Game, Messages and Meanings. In America, we call the schoolyard game Telephone Game. In England, it's known as Broken Telephone. In Australia, Chinese Whispers. In Japan, it's Din Game. No matter what you call it, the rules are the same, but these differences in names may be an illustration of why the game is so amusing in the first place. Did you know Japanese ceramics have had a tremendous influence in the United States? I believe it's the single most important influence on aesthetics, teaching, and practice of ceramic arts in the United States. It has a lot to do with the spread of the Ninge movement. Yanagi Suetsu, Hamada Shoji, and Bernard Leach formulated this fusion of handcraft, aesthetics, and spiritual philosophy, which became quite popular in Japan, England, and the United States. The young Peter Volkus assisted Hamada during his demonstrations and internalized something from Hamada's fluid way of working and aesthetic philosophy. In short order, he abandoned symmetry and function in pursuit of expression, never mind about the Minge ideology regarding pure beauty of the useful object. He synthesized influences from Japan with abstract expressionism, working with a charisma and outsized personality that became legendary as he toured the country demonstrating. He seldom worked alone, and his creativity thrived in front of an audience. His later work was almost exclusively fired in Anagama kilns built in America to emulate those of Shigaraki in Japan. His charisma and celebrity helped fuel an explosion in the popularity of wood firing in America. In Bernard Leach's A Potter's Book, Paul Sulner read an account of a Japanese Raku party and decided making Raku would be fun, quick, and exciting. Disappointed with the results, he proceeded to roll the red hot pots and some pepper tree leaves, hoping the smoke might improve the surface. It worked. Sulner went on to find delighted audiences everywhere, even at the beach. A Raku party, American style. Like his mentor, Volkus, his charismatic performances always brought a crowd. There's not a lot in common between the Japanese Raku tea bowl above and Soldner's below. Against the grain of the Menge movement, Soldner's process results in porous wear, and the glaze uses toxic ingredients to achieve colorful surfaces. This effectively kills any relationship to tea. Nevertheless, American Raku became extremely popular in the 1970s and 80s. Curiosity was on fire, and Western potters and artists and scholars came to Japan in great numbers to study ceramics in the 1960s and 70s. They went on to write important books and teach in major institutions throughout the United States and Europe. Today, Raku firing and wood firing events are embedded in the American college experience. In the spirit of Paul Solner, these events are fun and exciting, a great party, but have little in common with the original message. Coming to Japan made me reflect on how America got to this place, with our poisonous iridescent tea bowls and wood-fired Shino ware that gets used for swilling beer at college parties. The American attention span is short, and when we play the telephone game, we are often excitedly turning our head to pass the message before we've heard the whole thing. Clearly, the aesthetic philosophy is rooted in a different kind of party. When I first started thinking about researching ceramics in Japan, I got in touch with art historian Megan Jones, an expert in the field. She told me to understand Japanese ceramics, I needed to learn about tea and the Chanoyu. In 2012, I moved to the state of Alabama in the deep south of America, where I had been hired as a professor of art at the University of Montevallo. Montevallo is a sister city to Echizen in Fukui Prefecture. This connection planted the seed of an idea which became my proposal for this JUSFC fellowship. As I drove by this sign one morning, I realized Echizen might be my bridge to Japan. I knew a little about Echizen. I knew it was a ceramics town known for wood-fired pottery. I knew colleagues had gone there, and students from our university had studied there years ago. I began to read more about it and talk to people who had been there. I learned about the six ancient kilns and decided this would be as good a structure as any to base my research on. So let's take a tour. Echizen. In English, kiln can mean a single oven or furnace like we see the interior of in this picture. It can also mean a production site, which can include many individual kilns. 
This is the case for all the six ancient kilns. They are a collection of many, old and new, layered together. Today, Etchizen is the smallest, with only around 50 potteries producing work and one small roof tile factory. Like all the six ancient kilns, Etchizen was established around a thousand years ago to produce daily use items, especially large jars. Of all the ancient kilns, perhaps Etchizen has hung on to this tradition most tightly. The jar on the right is from the Momoyama period, and the one on the left was made last year. There's an amazing continuity of form and adherence to a graceful set of proportions. Also, like all of the six ancient kilns, Etchizen exists because of its natural resources, clay and wood. These fundamental elements have subtle differences between locations, resulting in distinctive characteristics. It is similar to the concept of terroir and wine, where the delicate combination of natural elements that impart a particular flavor. All of the clay used in Etchizen comes from this. Fundamentally, the kilns are industrial sites, mass producing products for daily life. As needs shifted over time, so did the products. Of all the six ancient kilns, Etchizen diversified the least and it nearly stopped production altogether in the 1900s. Even today, the one small roof tile factory is only operating at about 20% because of low demand. Tokonami is the furthest south of the ancient counts, very different from Echizen in many ways. Situated on a peninsula made of clay on the inland sea, it has always prospered from its ability to turn the soil into products for export all over Japan. Tokonami jars were the most widely distributed of all the ancient counts. For this reason, it is likely that Tokonami's techniques and forms served as models in establishing other counts. You can see some similarity between the Tokonami jar on the left and the Echizen one on the right. There's also a distinctly different color and texture, resulting from differences in clay and fire. Note the chunks stuck to the lower third of the jar on the left. Those chunks are the results of how the jars were stacked in the kiln to maximize space. These marks, dents, and chunks fused to the surface are in fact defects, which I'm sure the potters would have wanted to avoid. And it's not until much later do we see an intentional pursuit of such things for their aesthetic value. In fact, these kind of marks from firing are evident in products of all the ancient kilns, and in Tokonami's later industrial output as well. The city produced millions of sewer pipes, shotu bottles, and acid bottles from the late 1800s until fairly recently. I met a young gallery owner, passionate about pottery and the heritage of his town. He explained how on any given hill, one might find a light-colored clay at the top and red, brown, or yellow clay at the bottom. This results in a huge range of color and characteristics in the pottery. Seto, just to the north of Tokonami, Seto is also a major center of industrial production with active factories and abundant resources. Like its southern neighbor, Seto successfully adapted to changing markets and has mass produced everything from sewer pipes to porcelain figurines. Seto has also been an important player in the telephone game. In the left column, you see work from Song Dynasty China. In the middle column, Seto interpretations and to the right, Seto expansion on those ideas. Seto is the only ancient kiln with a long history of glaze use. From early on, Seto ceramics closely followed traditions and techniques from mainland Asia. Over time, these forms and traditions took on their own identity, passing on a message heavily interpreted over generations. Seto's glaze relates to its diverse geology, with all the materials needed to make not only clay and fire, but glaze as well. There are thousands of kiln sites in the surrounding area, and finding things like this by the side of the road is very common. One of Seto's great contributions to ceramics is Oribe ware. With its delightful interplay of line on form, surprising use of color and variety, it is easy to see why it was a favorite of ancient tea masters and has been studied extensively by potters in the West. Seto is also known for blue on white, as well as the obligatory brown jar. Notice, though, that this brown comes from a glaze, not from raw wood-fired clay. In fact, Seto potters went to great lengths to protect some work from wood ash in the kiln, firing it inside the cylinders. Picture that, right? 
Shigaraki is probably the ancient town best known to ceramic artists in America because of Peter Volkus's connection to it. The name was often thrown around in his demonstrations in reference to the clay or the kilns or the wood firing. In fact, this is really what I expected to see when I went to Shigaraki, a red clay made unusually coarse by chunks of feldspar rock, which melt into white glass bumps in the kiln. Volkus irreverently referred to these as zits, but it was so infatuated with the material that he had huge quantities of it imported to the United States. I also expected to see this. This is the stuff American wood fire potters get so excited about and work so hard to emulate. There's no glaze on any of these. The glassy surfaces, drips, greens, blues, grades, and flashes of bright orange are all products of being slowly fired with wood for one or two weeks. Shigaraki delivered on those expectations. Shigaraki's beautiful rural setting doesn't at first reveal its industrial side but Shigaraki has a history of mass production, including alcohol stills, glazed urns, train teapots, and even ceramic landmines. Tamba, situated in an idyllic little valley, Tamba is the most rural of the ancient kilns, with a collection of pottery scattered along a few kilometers of countryside. Tamba is only slightly bigger than Echizen, with about 60 potteries still producing. The kiln pictured here is a split bamboo kiln, characteristic of Tamba, and this one is especially long at nearly 50 meters. In Tamba, as in Bizen, the source of clay is in the valley floor, under the rice paddies themselves. I had read most of the potters in Tamba were also farmers right up until the 1960s, which makes sense when you consider this. As in Echizen, clay is processed at a small central factory administered by a potter's collective. The collective also operates a store, which helps promote commerce and tourism in the area. Tamba's clay is also similar to Echizen's in its warm red appearance, but what attracted the attention of tea masters and later Minge followers is the contrasting fluid green glaze coming from the enormous amount of wood ash accumulated in the lengthy firings. It is thought such colors come from trace minerals in the soil absorbed by the trees as they grow. Tamba also has a glaze tradition dating to several hundred years ago. I was amazed to see these glazed jars in the old Tamba Pottery Museum in Sasayama, which also clued me into the fact that the area in general produced pottery, not just the idyllic valley where I saw the long kiln. One of Tamba's main industries was the production of sake bottles. There was a strong connection between the Tamba technique for writing on sake bottles and a medieval English technique called slip trailing. In the family store of Shigeyoshi Ichino, I learned about a long friendship with Bernard Leach and his wife, Janet. Yanagi and Leach visited Tamba and invited Ichino to go to England, where he worked at the Leach Pottery for three years. Janet Leach spent a significant time in Tamba working at the Ichino family pottery. My last stop on the tour of ancient kilns was also one well known in the West. Bizen is often spoken of in breathless tones by wood fire enthusiasts who are always in awe of the rich surfaces achieved through long firing with a unique clay. My highlight was this hillside covered in debris of hundreds of years of kiln activity set in this incredible landscape. Several massive central kilns operated here, burning untold forests in the effort to transform untold tons of clay into jars, bowls, sake bottles, sculptures, and anything else people might need or want. Without doubt, this was a major source of material culture, and standing on the refuse left behind, seeing the fragments of failure was a powerful experience. Bizen pottery is remarkably homogenous. I found no shops selling glazed work, Every gallery and shop I entered had some version of this scene. But on closer inspection, I began to understand the charm of Bizen is in its simplicity and in the variety that can be found there. It is one type of clay, no glaze, wood fired for a long time, typically two weeks. The color ranges from light gray to orange, to yellow, to brown, to black. Understandably, this kind of unpredictability has created a cult-like following among potters. It is a costly endeavor. Drying wood and aging clay are a common sight in the yards of potteries. 
Both represent a significant expense for the makers. Many potters use clay harvested from rice paddies several generations ago, processing it themselves. The wood must be purchased, split, and dried. The bees in a kiln is a hungry one. According to the owner of this one, it will consume around a million yen worth of wood over the course of a two-week fire. He explained that as part of the reason why bees in wear is generally more expensive than other types. He also explained that his kiln has zones that produce particular colors, and over time he has learned to have some degree of control. Next steps. I have a head full of ideas. My teacher, Linda Sakura, once told me, ideas are a dime a dozen. Show me something and we'll talk. I have to put everything out in front of me and painstakingly find connections between fragments. This is how I work, whether I'm planning a, present, a project for students, building a lecture, or making my own artwork. I have, for some time now, moved away from my roots as a potter. While the material and process is integral to my creative identity, I no longer practice making pottery on a regular basis. I have become instead a collector of shards and a maker of broken or incomplete things. My process is often experimental, utilizing product, products of chance. Collage is a key strategy in both physical and conceptual organization. I'm always looking for connections, threads to weave disparate elements together, ways to connect material messages with cultural meanings. I often utilize compositional devices rooted in Chinese landscape paint, such as host and guest, with major forms such as mountains or trees being informed by subordinate but equally important guest elements. I'm trying to explore an imaginary landscape, a place experienced in memory and dream. These relationships suggest themselves naturally in my collection of shards and field experiments. Now, I can't help but realize how indebted to Japanese aesthetic philosophy I am, how much this appreciation of the imperfect has given me permission to explore breakage and repair as a creative process. And also, how much the idea that objects have embedded significance, instilled in them by their materials and their makers, has influenced my practice. What a gift! To know that in working with roof tiles from 100 years ago, I can collaborate with makers in that time and place. What a gift to know that these objects, raw or refined, black or white, empty or full, whole or broken, all have a voice, a part to play, and it is our privilege to be in this conversation. Perhaps Yanagi said it best, after all, there is no greater opportunity for appreciating beauty than through its use in our daily lives. No greater opportunity for coming into direct contact with the beautiful. It was the tea masters who first recognized this fact. This journey has been filled with people and places that will fuel my creative and teaching practice for years to come. It has reminded me of the importance of a close relationship with nature, with spirituality, with the effort to locate and accept oneself in the ever-shifting balance of perfection and imperfection. It has brought me closer to the meaning of messages whispered across the ocean, across telephone lines, murky with time and distance. Thank you.